in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, PL 1975, Chapter 231, adequate notice of this regular meeting of the Board of Adjustment of the Township of Franklin has been provided. Mr. Betterbid. Here. Ms. Graman asked to be excused. Mr. Johnson. Here. Mr. McCracken. Here. Mr. Rich. Here. Mr. Shepard. Here. Mr. Caldwell. Here. Mr. Rosenthal. Here. Mr. Reese. Here. Mr. Begala. Here. Chairman Thomas. Here. Uh, we have meeting, uh, minutes of the regular meeting, January 8th, 2015. I, I, I move for approval. Second. Mr. McCracken. Yes. Mr. Rich. Yes. Mr. Shepard. Uh, yes. Mr. Begala. Yes. Chairman Thomas. Yes. Uh, vouchers. March retainer, 865, various matters, 555. Well, we also have uh, the, the, the February 5th meeting. The minutes for the February 5th meeting. Oh. All right, I was just going by oh. the agenda. We also have meetings of what day? Fe February 5th. Is there a second? Second. I, I got to check to see who's eligible to vote there, Bob. Oh. You have those in front of me. Let me see who is here. Not so many. Yes, they got time. Mr. McCracken. Yes. Mr. Rich. Yes. Mr. Shepard. Yes. Mr. Begala. Yes. Chairman Thomas. Yes. Thank you. All right. March retainer eight sixty five. Various matters five fifty five. We can entertain a motion on both. Moved. Second. This is all in favor. Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion passed. Uh, all the hearings listed on the agenda are due to be heard. So we will start Go Govindasamy and Mirtha Nadamuthu. I hope that is close. ZBA 15000003. Certification of a pre existing non conforming use in which the applicant is stating there are two dwellings on one property at 121, 123. Pursuit Street, Somerset, Block 178, Lot 1, the Hamilton Business District Zone. Okay. Good evening. Mike. You've got to turn it on. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be on. It's two, I think. We like to confuse you right up front. Yeah. Is it double switch? Apparently. Is it on the bottom? No. Nope. Huh? There you go. There you go. Hey. You see, I'm the board attorney in South Brunswick, and they have a double switch also, so I'm always watching the attorneys <laughs> where the experts struggle, so now I'm put in their seat. <laughs> I'll be a more sympathetic board attorney. I guess so we buy forward. it from the same place. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Benjamin Buca for firm of Buchan Camposano, and I'm uh, very happy to be here tonight uh, representing my clients. I have very long names, but I'm just going to say for tonight, we can all uh, refer to my client as Nadi and his wife, Amy. And uh, we're here for an application for a, a certificate of nonconformity. Uh, and uh, we'll have uh, three witnesses uh, this evening, as well as some documents that we've already submitted, as, as well as um, that should be in your packet, as well as some additional documents that we'll bring tonight. The three uh, witnesses uh, will be my client Natty, as well as uh, one of the tenants who's been residing in his apartment, is in this uh, one of the homes for 30 years now, as well as we have an expert tonight that I think you're going to find uh, very interesting, Keith Thadinga. It's actually going to be uh, Mr. Thadinga's first time testifying before a board, uh, but I'm I'm kind confident you're going to find him uh, well qualified as well as as well as uh, very well educated and, and it'll be very informative on the issue of how old is how old are these two structures on the one lot can, so can, with can you as part of your introduction tell us how it came about that this this became an issue I'll be glad to I was um, my client is a distinguished professor at Fairleigh Dickinson University and he is now retired uh, with his retirement, he wants to enjoy it, and uh, 
not have to be burdened with, who sometimes to, to be burdened with the obligations of owning an, invest, an investment home. So he went to sell the home. And when he sold the home, uh, there developed then a zoning issue. And, the zone, and the, the, um, although it passed all code inspections, it did not pass zoning and that they were not certain whether uh, these two homes, there was some confusion initially as to whether this was a three family or whether these homes were permitted or not. He's, he, they searched all the uh, township documents and there were no documents showing permits for the construction of these two buildings. Wow. So when I took over, when I took over the, uh, this matter, um, to me, the application was, was clear that there was a two-family home and a single-family home on one lot. Both uses are permitted in the zone, um, but uh, two, principal, two principal structures on one lot is not permitted. So the nonconformity is actually the structures, and it came about from his desire to, uh, when, when he wanted to sell the home for his retirement. Okay, great, thanks. You're welcome. Shall I proceed? Yep. Okay. Well, let's have Dottie come up first. Why don't you just sit right over there? Who swears in the witness? The, um, this make sure, Keith, make sure that mic's on. It the, is. Okay. okay, very good. If you'll raise your right hand for me, solemnly swear or affirm to tell the whole truth, Hold nothing the but the truth. Close to your lips. <coughs> just say yes now, you're good. I do. Okay, and tell us your name for the record spelling and your last name. Uh, my name is Dottie Lewis, uh, L E W I S. Thank you. Hold the mic Hold to your the lips. Close. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Thanks. Ms. Lewis, uh, where do you live? I live at 123 Casu Street, Somerset, New Jersey. And that's a, you live there alone? That's a single family home, correct? Yes. And how long have you been living there for? 30 years. And uh, when did, uh, Miss, do you remember when Nadia took over uh, ownership of the property? In August of uh, 1985. Of 1985. You've yes. been residing there ever since. Yes. Okay. And when you uh, resided, when you uh, moved in in August of 1985, how would you describe the, you know, the condition of the home? It was lived in. It was lived in. It needed some work. It needed painting. It needed, you know, plumbing, different things like that. In. So as a layperson, uh, you could tell that in 1985, this was not a new home. Exactly. Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. That's all I have of Ms. Okay. Lewis. Thank yeah. you. Only open to the public once. That would be great. Okay. So go ahead. Uh, the other, just so at this point in time, just so it goes chronology, I did submit a statement. Uh, it's a sworn statement from uh, Mr. Mel Markowitz. It's not quite in the form that I would have liked. Uh, I emailed it to him, and when he printed it out, it printed out funny, and he signed it. But uh, the statement goes on to say that Mr. Markowitz was is, uh, was the owner of Lorraine's. So, so many, many I'm sure know Lorraine's, may have known Mr. Markowitz, had been working there since 1966. And in his statement, uh, he certifies that uh, both buildings, 121 and 123 Costa Street, were there, were, were not new construction, uh, and were there as of 1966. And so with that, then, I'd like to call uh, my client, Nadi. Yes, sir. If you'll use the microphone, raise your right hand. He saw me swear from tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yes, sir, I do. And um, what's your first name? Govind Dasani. Okay, I got the spelling of it. Very good, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Nani, you bought uh, the property at 121, 123 Costa Street in 1985. Yes, sir. And you've owned it ever since, correct? Yes, yes sir. And you're now retired from uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University? Yes, sir. And uh, you, as I explained, uh, you want to enjoy your retirement and, and not be have the obligations of uh, being responsible for uh, an investment property. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And perhaps bear the fruit of the increased value of your property, hopefully. I hope so, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, when uh, you went to sell the home, uh, you found out that there was a zoning problem, and so you were unable to sell the property. Is that yes. correct? Yes, sir. And so then, you did you not uh, check your records then? Yes, sir. And I'm going to show you a document, which is in everyone's packet. It's from uh, MMG, I think that's MGM. MGM Associates. Do you, uh, do you recognize this document? Yes, sir. And what is th this document that has a title of MGM Associates that's in the board's packet? Uh, Revaluation, Franklin Township, November 11, 1993. And this was sent to you as the owner of the property when this reevaluation was performed, correct? Yes, that's correct. And this shows a reevaluation of uh, the first. Um, uh, unofficial property tax uh, property data card is of uh, the 
121 Costa Street, which is a two-family. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And you've kept this document in your possession since the time that you re yes, received sir. it. Yes, I do have the original too. Okay, and in that document, it's showing on the right-hand side of the year, the year built. Yes, sir. And what does it show for that? 1930. All right. And then the uh, the second reassessment was for 123. Casa Street, is that correct? Yes, sir. It does have the same address as 121, but we know it's 123 because it listed as a one family. Is that right? That's correct, sir. So 121, which is the house that is closest to Hamilton Street mm -hmm. on Casa, is a two family house, correct? Yes, sir. And the one and the second property uh, structure on your property, 123 Casa Street, is a single family house. That's correct, sir. And that's where Miss Lewis lives, right? Yes, sir. Yes. And in there, what does the uh, the assessment show as to when the property was built 1940 okay so if I'm going to show you a document we're going to mark it a1 and I'll present this then to the board chair uh, do you recognize this document yes sir and what is this document it shows the two separate buildings one is 121 Kasut Street and the other is 123 Kasut Street and who took this picture this picture was taken by the real estate agent Julie Connell and when did she, approximately when did she take this? Uh, she took it summer, summer of last year. And does this picture accurately reflect what, you, what the condition of the two homes were in at the time that she took the picture? Yes, sir. And I'm going to show you another picture which is marked A2 for identification. Do you recognize that? Yes, sir. And what does this picture show? This also shows the two buildings, 121 and 123 Castle Street. And also in the background, you can see the wall belonging to Lorraine's. Okay. And... It, this picture was taken at the same time yes, by the real estate agent, and it accurately reflects what the condition of, of all the structures were at that time. Yes, sir. Okay, I'll present these to the board. Okay. Now, did you also make a request uh, from the township for any uh, evidence of uh, permits as to when these homes would have been constructed? Yes, sir, I did. And the township was unable to provide you with any such documents? That's correct, sir. Okay. And as ultimately... Okay, so that's all I have. Are there any questions for my client? Any questions? Next witness. Okay. Now, now, before we go forward, I have a, a question for the for the board attorney. Okay. Um, what are we looking for here? Are we looking for um, Your construction from before the time that there were? Zoning laws in this town? Well, I think that's what we're he's gonna just trying to. She's asking me, Ben. I'm, you're not this board attorney. You're <laughs> board right. <laughs> this is the one I want. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, what they're trying to establish, because both of these are permitted, um, they want to show that they've been used as such. There's been no uh, lapse in time. And so zoning. 58. 1958. So, so, if so they, far, they're if doing they, a pretty good job. 1930 so and 1940. So if they existed prior to 1958 and they were used as houses continuously since 1958, that will be, be okay? That would be enough for you to certify <laughs> as pre-existing. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah, and, and Mr. Mr. Shepard, um, upon visiting the house with someone from construction, it's quite evident that the years listed 1930 and 40 that those homes were clearly based on the construction techniques were clearly built in that era so they were there we just unfortunately don't have building permits if they even required a building permit back then in our records okay called Vince and and they appeared to be built as houses or yes a commercial structure now they 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 appear based on the inspection to be built as homes <laughs> Okay. If you raise your right well, hand Keith for me. Keith Tadinga. Solemnly swear from tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Okay. okay. Uh, Keith, uh, could you please give the board the benefit of your education experience, uh, your education and your work experience, uh, which uh, lends to your having expertise in uh, the area of determining the age of structures? Sure. Um, I began my career uh, as a volunteer firefighter. I've been a firefighter for 13 years. I'm a, uh, a fire, have been a fire inspector and now a fire marshal for uh, 12 years. Uh, over the years, I have licenses in um, uh, fire prevention, but also on the construction side and fire protection. 
Uh, I'm a licensed home inspector. Um, I have also uh, enforced property maintenance code, housing code. I have licenses in uh, hotel multiple dwelling in, uh, inspections. And um, I think that that. And how many, how many inspections of, of residences have you made and where you become familiar as to where, you know, approximately when homes would be constructed? Um, I'm, I'm not able to put that into a number. I mean, I mean that many, right? Yeah, yes. But the, the, bottom, the bottom line is you're, you're offering him as an expert and someone who can go into a structure and tell the age of the construction based on his experience and his licenses. Thank you. Right? Yes. We, we can accept that. Your, your only problem was your attorney told us you were brand new and this is the first time. So. Yeah. Oh. Okay. okay. <laughs> we accept it. Go ahead. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so when you were retained on, on this matter, what uh, what uh, then did you commence with? As uh, how did you commence with your investigation of these properties? Uh, I inspected both properties, uh, one two uh, one two one and one two three Costed Street. Um, I went through both buildings and looked at the uh, different components of the buildings to determine age. And what were you looking for? Um, I looked f uh, at the electrical systems, uh, wall coverings, the windows, uh, lumber, and uh, any artifacts that I could find in the home. And so uh, to get specifically then, what did you find, what did your uh, inspection reveal with regard to the windows that was of significance in determining the age of both these structures? Uh, the windows in both homes were uh, counterweighted sash windows, um, a window type that was phased out right around World War II. Um, <coughs> they, uh, after World War II, they went to a, a, a spring balance sash. Um, the, uh, also, uh, 1930, they went from a cotton sash cord to a chain. So I, I was looking at around 1930s at, for these homes. And uh, in addition then to the uh, windows, what did you observe with regard to the lumber that was used in the uh, construction of the home? Uh, in both homes, uh, the lumber sizes varied. Um, I did find nominal two by eights. <coughs> uh, they were all rough cut, meaning they weren't planed down or dressed. Uh, so you could actually see bandsaw marks from the mill. Um, so I had two by eights uh, all the way down to uh, inch and five eighths by seven and a half. Uh, in 1924, a central committee uh, came up with some sort of lumbered standard, and at, uh, that committee reduced the sizes from two by eights down to one and five, one and five eighths, and, and seven and a half. Then, in the early 1960s, 1961. Uh, they reduced it down to the modern standard, which you would find, you know, the inch and a half uh, by seven and a quarter for a two by eight. And the, uh, the uh, joists, floor joists were all two by eight. And so what, what, what is the significance of, of those findings in terms uh, of determining the age of the structure? That it, it does put the, the, uh, the floor joists or the, the wood of the structure uh, prior to uh, 1961. At the very least, I mean, I, it could go back all the way to 1924 when these new standards, first set of standards, were adopted. And when you talked about the, the wood, the, the the lumber being a rough cut, um, maybe some board members, maybe board members know what that is, but maybe I know I didn't. I learned yeah. this from you, so maybe you could explain what that means. So I, again, uh, rough cut being you would see the the edges are very square as opposed to more modern wood. You would have kind of rounded edges, but they would be, uh, modern lumber is dressed, or so they would use a, a planes uh, to mill it down to the current dimension. Uh, back then, they would have just used the bandsaw, been at the lumber yard, and, and kind of, uh, you know, sold that way. What did you observe with regard to the plaster and the lathe regarding the house? Um, so I did observe plaster and lath in 123 Costa Street. Um, plaster and lath, again, was a building material used uh, right up until World War II. After World War II, there was a housing boom, so houses were being constructed a lot quicker. They were looking for faster means to construct houses, so they switched over to sheetrock. Um, prior to that, plaster and lath, if you're not familiar with it, is, you know, wood strips about one and a half inches. They'd be tacked up to the, uh, 
the studs in the wall and then plaster would be put over as a wall covering. And how about with regard to then the electrical? Okay. What did you find? Um, so in both homes, I didn't find evidence of knob and tube. Uh, this was a, a, a type of uh, electric wiring that was present before 1930. So um, what I did find was armored cable, which became popular in the 1930s. Uh, most of the armored cable, uh, if not all of it, was ungrounded. Uh, we didn't start seeing grounded cables uh, until about 1959. Um, I did fi also find um, some what's called uh, rag wire or braided Romex wiring, which became popular in about 1958. Uh, 55 rather, it was ungrounded. Uh, they didn't start really grounding, like I said, in uh, wires or any type of uh, conduit until uh, uh, around 1959. And then finally in the early 1960s is when they started coming up with the thermoplastic, like the modern Romex wiring that you'd see in a home. And uh, one 21 Casas, which is the two family, had two electrical meters? Yes. During your inspection, yes. and there was they're visible in the photos. And then well. there was one electrical meter on 123. Yes. Casas Street. Okay. Did you um, artifacts? What did you find? Um, so, I mean, one uh, cool thing that I did find in 121 Casas was um, behind the uh, the wood where the electric panels were mounted. I found a newspaper, and I have photos of where I found it. But uh, we pulled it out, and the newspaper was dated uh, 1947. So I thought that was a, a pretty nice thing to find. Also, in the basement, uh, on one of the floor joists, tacked up to a floor joist, were uh, remnants of newspaper. Don't know why they would be there, but they were dated uh, 1951. And throughout your inspection of both structures, uh, there was uh, only evidence of it being used as a, a residential <coughs> use. Yes, yes. And, and um, after your inspection, then what further in, uh, investigation did you perform with regard to this property? So uh, I went into Google and typed in the address and historic photos just for kicks to see what would happen. And a website popped up called Historic Aerials. Um, and this is a website that has historic aerial photographs um, from the U.S. Geological Survey and also... Uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. I found, I was able to find the property. I, I have photos here uh, of the two corner property, uh, of the two houses on the corner property. Um, one of the images is from 1953. The other image is from 1956. And the one in 1953 shows, uh, in pertinent part, what does it show that uh, it, the board should know? Uh, in this photo, it shows two structures on the property, uh, minus Lorraine's. And in 1956, what, what does the one show? It shows the, the two structures on the property, or homes, and then Lorraine's. Okay. Would you like to see these pictures? You can mark them A3 and A4 if you'd they're like. Just, they're interesting <laughs> to look at. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll bring them up. We also have the newspaper. Yeah. I don't think they need that. We're good. That'd be hard to find. <laughs> okay. So, based on based on your education experience and based on your in, uh, inspection of the home and your subsequent investigation, do you have an opinion as to the age of these two structures? Um, I have a uh, an approximate age. And it's really a range between 1930 and 1945. That's all I have. Any questions? I have a question. Go ahead. In the two-family house, um, what made you form your opinion that it was constructed as a two-family residence besides the electrical meters? Uh, yeah, I, I, I wasn't looking. We, yeah, we, we, we did. Uh, that's right. We really didn't look at the um, use because the use is permitted. So. Um, uh, so, so today, m my client has has the right to use it as a, as a two-family, 
once the zone once the zone allows that as as a two family use. So I didn't. <laughs> so Mr. Thedingo was not engaged to determine um, the use because of that reason. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions? So what you're what you're certifying is that there are two principal uses on the lot. That's, that's right. Whether that two now it's a two family. Whether that was a one family at the time it was constructed or not is irrelevant. It is a permitted use now. That's exactly right. Okay. Any other questions? We'll open to the public. Is there anyone who'd like to ask any questions or make a statement concerning the application? Then we'll close. And any last second desperation, please, we'll entertain. <laughs> I'll submit to the board. <laughs> if not, we'll look for any discussion or questions or motions. I, 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 I move that we approve this. Uh, Is there a second? Second. Second. Mr. Betterbid? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. McCracken? Yes. Mr. Rich? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Caldwell? Yes. Chairman Thomas? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Good job. <coughs> uh, promotion in motion incorporated. ZBA 15 zero 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 five signed variance in which the applicant is proposing a sign at one heller drive somerset block five you want the picture you want these pictures back and the m1 you want zone. these pictures back please i think they're an exhibit now. yeah but we won't keep them back. okay all right yeah yeah take them back beautiful thanks Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Peter Lanford appearing on behalf of the applicant. Uh, this is an application for a sign variance to construct an attached sign uh, at the building, which was norm uh, formerly known as Toys R Us, which is currently being leased by my client. Uh, at the present time, there is no attached sign on the building. We are proposing to have one sign, which exceeds the sign requirements of the ordinance. Uh, your ordinance permits a uh, one attached sign, uh, which should consist of 5% of the first floor building face area or 100% maximum. Uh, we exceed that, and we're here to request a variance, and I'll ex have my client explain why we are seeking the sign. Uh, I will call as my first witness, Mr. McSorley. Yes, sir, if you raise your right hand. Tell me, swear, affirm, tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Could you spell your last name for me? McSorley, capital M-C, capital S-O-R-L-E-Y. Thanks. Mr. McSorley, by whom are you employed? Uh, Pim Brands, LLC, limited. Okay. And in what capacity? I'm the director of the plant and facilities. Okay. And what is... Pim Brands. We're the manufacturing division of promotion and motion companies. We make Welch's fruit snacks, uh, sun-made chocolate raisins, and various other confections that you find in um, retail stores and movie theaters. And do you currently have facilities in Franklin Township? Yes, we have two facilities, one at 500 Pier Street, which is our manufacturing facility, and next door at 1600 Cottontail Lane. Okay, 500 Pier Street, how big a building is that approximately? 200,000 square feet. Okay, and you conduct manufacturing at that site? That's correct. Okay, and how many employees do you have at that site? Uh, currently 537 employees. Okay. We run 24-7, 360 days a year. So, so you are, you've occupied that whole building then? Yes, we do. <coughs> okay. Okay. The 1600 Cottontail, what do you do with that building? Cottontail is a just-in-time warehouse and will also be uh, part of a process, chocolate processing facility, and it is uh, 79,000 square feet. And how many employees work at that site? Currently 30 on the first shift and 1545. Okay. You've signed a lease now to lease the building that is the subject of this application. Is that correct? Correct. At one, one Heller Lane. And how big is that building? 325,000 square feet. Okay, and uh, what do you intend to do with that building? It's going to uh, be a dual uh, function. 
it's starting out as a distribution warehouse for all of our products, our finished goods. Um, the reason for the sign, and this is the second part of the building, we're going to uh, be open to public tours for the factory. And One Heller Lane will be the beginning uh, drop-off point for visitors coming in to take a factory tour. And when you say a factory tour, how do you anticipate or how do you envision this working? In the plan at 500 Pier Street, we'll be erecting uh, a catwalk inside that uh, the public will come in and be able to walk through the entire building to see the processing, manufacturing process of the Welch's fruit snacks. And the way this is going to work is that the the tour would start at this facility at One Heller? Correct. Because of the amount of parking space open at One Heller, people would come to One Heller Lane. Um, and again, that's the purpose of the sign, to give them a destination marking, uh, knowing that they're in the right location. They would park there, and then we'll be developing a shuttle trolley system uh, that people would then be taken down to 500 Pier Street. Once they complete that tour, they would then go over to 1600 Cottontail Lane to see how chocolate is processed, and then back up to One Heller Lane. Okay, and with respect to this second aspect, the tour, tour aspect, have you been working with Franklin Township, uh, and have they encouraged you to uh, move forward on this uh, part of your project? Yes, we have. We've been working uh, closely with Councilwoman Rosalind um, sure. German, sorry, and uh, Actually, she just came to the factory a couple of months ago to ask a status update because Franklin Township is looking uh, to pin brands to become a center of tourism for the county. Okay, so obviously this sign is not being promoted or proposed for identification for your employees or for truck drivers or for anything else, and it's really for the starting point and uh, focal point for your tour. That's correct. Okay. Uh, with respect to the long-range plans for this facility, uh, does the company have long-range plans for one heller? Uh, yes. The, as I said, it's going to start out as our uh, finished goods sh shipping and receiving warehouse. There's an, a building behind it that we call the terminal building. It's a smaller building. Our long-range plans, if everything goes the way that we hope, we would be knocking down the terminal building behind it. Um, and erecting a building that will be a high-density warehouse. And then this building that you see here would become a manufacturing, additional manufacturing, and we would also build in some tour features there so that people could be staged in each one of the three buildings as they went through their tour for the day. Okay. And, and who do you envision taking your tours? Oh, um, <coughs> practically anybody that likes candy. Uh, <laughs> but school groups, <laughs> church groups, um, and the open to the general public. Projections are that in the first year that we should expect 300 to 500,000 people to come through. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions. Any the, questions? Yes, I have a couple. The building that this, this sign is on the, on the front of, um, th that building's got 325,000 square feet in it? Yes, it does, sir. And, and that building... Again, you occupy, you're the only entity in that building. We will be the only entity. It's been unoccupied, from what I understand, for the last 10 years. Okay. And Matrix uh, Building Group has purchased the building for us. We're lease purchasing it from them, and they're doing $5 million worth of renovations for us. Okay. But we will be the only tenant. <coughs> okay. Um, I think that's the only question I had. Yeah. Any other pictures then? I think no. the pictures were all submitted as part. Of, does the board have pictures in their packet? Yeah. Did submit yeah. one. Yeah. There's just one. It's the same picture. It's quite a sign. Excuse me. It's quite a sign. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get. I get. Mr. Rasha, you don't have. A no, picture. I got it. I'm okay. sorry. I'll give you the you color. Want color? color? <laughs> yes, we don't have any color. It's in evidence. Okay. Did you say which street the sign's going to face? We got a color one. It will face Heller Lane. Okay. Okay. Thanks. At toward the corner, correct of schoolhouse and, and Keller. Keller, correct. Okay. No, no, uh, no, no samples. Any other questions? All, all the samples are in my office. <laughs> <laughs> Any other witnesses? I have uh, no other witnesses. Go ahead. If I may, just very briefly, uh, uh, this is 
you know, under normal circumstances, the size of this sign would be totally inappropriate uh, for just a manufacturing facility. But this is part of something that is above and beyond what is a manufacturing facility. Also, this is probably the biggest building uh, in Franklin Township uh, that is either office or warehouse. If in fact this building was divided into numerous tenants, each tenant would be allowed to have signage. And quite frankly, we would probably get close to that number if there were multiple tenants. However, since we have the whole building, uh, and given the circumstances of what we are doing, we think that the sign is appropriate. In addition, very briefly, across the street is a uh, moving company, which also had some sign variances because I did those many years ago. This is also in the middle of an industrial area, which the sign doesn't have any impact on any residences. The sign is not lit, so it'll only be visible during the daylight hour. And would you agree uh, th that you will not in the future light the sign? If we decide that we, w we would agree as a condition, we may, depending on how things run, if things happen at night, we would agree to come back and ask to light it at night. But we will agree at this point in time not to light it. OK, good. And I have to say that that's one of the most clever arguments I've ever heard you make. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been on this board for 10 years. That was really good. I hope I have something left for later. <laughs> Next witness. That's it. That's it, I think. All right, we'll open to the public. Is there anyone who wants to ask any questions or make a statement or request candy? <laughs> All right, we'll close. Any board questions? I, 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 I move the variance. You're not even going to ask him for a summary? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, he didn't have I, I gave my summary. Oh, we, 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 OK, we let's have, no we'll take a motion. <laughs> before, you, before you do, I do have one question. And maybe you might have um, answered it before. But approximately when do you expect the tours to start taking place? We actually in the factory do private tours right now for school groups and uh, throughout Somerset County and, and other groups. For instance, if you all would like a tour of the factory, we could arrange that any evening. Um, but we're planning on the catwalk being built if everything goes right with permitting and plans somewhere in the mid to end of 2016. Okay, any, if there's nothing further, any motion? No, he moved it. Oh. Did you move it? Joe? He moved it. Second. I, 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 Is there yeah, a second. 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 Okay. Mr. Betterbid? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. McCracken? Yes. Mr. Rich? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Caldwell? Yes. Chairman Thomas? Yes. I think even if you only achieve your minimum goals, that's a win-win a for this town. Thank you very much. Great, Thank you. Great job. Can our attorney make sure that the uh, that in the resolution is their agreement that they're not going to light it? I got it. Good. Yep. Thanks okay. for the invite. That's great. Okay. Alternatives Incorporated, ZBA 14000021. Use variance and site plan, which the applicants proposing one two story two unit residential community residence building 558 560 madison avenue somerset block 542 slots 22 to 29 in the orange yeah, zone. It, mr chairman let me give you a little brief intro this is really kind of interesting what they want to erect is a community residence which is a permitted use as per the municipal land use law the reason they're here tonight is because there's an existing D1 use variance on the property. So theoretically, there's an effect on that existing variance. So they need the new, uh, the new, the new D1. They also need a variance for uh, for parking. That they'll provide the testimony. That 17 are required and only eight are proposed. And they're going to provide testimony why that's an adequate amount. Okay, go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. My name is Teresa Garcia. I'm from the firm of Peter N. Lab and Associates on behalf of the applicant. Um, as he indicated, we have a couple of witnesses, so I'm going to get right to it. We have four. Um, the witness sitting next to me is Tom Sher. He's a representative for the applicant alternatives. Please, sir, if you raise your right hand, tell me swear from tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Uh, tell me your name again. My name is Tom Sher. 
Spell that S. S C H E R R. Okay, thanks. Alternatives is a nonprofit social service agency uh, that is headquartered in Raritan, New Jersey. Uh, it's been in existence for about 35 years. Um, uh, we serve uh, the majority of central New Jersey, uh, individuals with special needs, um, other vulnerable populations such as uh, formerly homeless, um, uh, and, and so on. Um, ADTI is the housing subsidiary that will be developing this project. Um, it's a wholly owned subsidiary of the parent company Alternatives dedicated to the maintenance and uh, development of new housing options. Um, this property uh, was originally, um, there was one single family home um, that uh, provided housing. When Alternatives took it over in the 90s, uh, 1994, they expanded and they got a use variance um, to house formerly homeless families. Um, the, uh, the site that we're proposing tonight is a community residence for individuals with de developmental disabilities. Um, due to the nature of both populations, formerly <coughs> homeless and uh, individuals with developmental disabilities, the likelihood that they're going to have their own vehicle is very, very slim. Um, <coughs> everybody in, in, uh, in the programs would be uh, very low income. Um, so alternatives, the social service provider would be providing transportation. And we anticipate four agency-owned vehicles to be on site um, with, with a couple staff members, depending on the shift. Um, so we feel that the parking would be adequate. How many people are going to be living in this facility? Four individuals in the new facility. OK, now that answer poses another question. The, there is an, I thought that they were going, you're not going to tear down the existing facility. You're going to leave the existing facility there and you're going to build another building on the property that will house four individuals. Correct. That's the intent. Will the uh, original uh, uh, building still continue to be used for formerly homeless people? Correct. And when you say that they are formerly homeless, is the place where they're staying now, is that, their, is that why they're formerly, because they have some place to live now? Correct. The, okay. This is considered transitional housing. Okay. Uh, and the people who live in the homeless shelter, they are not developmentally disabled? That is not a requirement of the program. A requirement. That's an interesting word. Um, well, so, uh, it, it's possible. Yeah. But they, they but it's a, it doesn't right. Okay. So, and then can you describe for me uh, the nature of the developmental disabilities that the people who will be living there will have? Right now, the, the state of New Jersey is um, pushing to, uh, um, based off of some, some lawsuits, to, to get some people placed in permanent housing that have been on... Uh, uh, been on waiting lists to be placed for years and years and years. So what we're seeing currently is a more <laughs> medically involved clientele. In fact, the first level of uh, uh, the two-story building is going to be designed to be fully accessible, um, not only just for people in wheelchairs, um, also individuals that may need the use of a shower trolley. So we're, we're, we're talking about fairly um, uh, disabled individuals. Are these the people who are currently being housed in the facilities that the, that the, that the governor would like to close? It, it would vary. It's based off of the referrals from the uh, Division of Developmental Disabilities. Okay. How many, how many staff uh, will be uh, staffing the... Uh, it, it, it will vary. Um, we'll, we'll, there will be some pooling of staff for the current programs, but you, you can probably anticipate, depe depending on the needs of the actual residents that are placed, um, one to two staff. So, so one person per uh, um, two residents is pretty typical. For more intensive services, you may see one-on-one. -on -one. But there's um, going to be three shifts, right? There's going to be two people there, uh, three eight-hour shifts. Yes, yes. That that that. And that's both how both both buildings. That that would it, the the staffing would vary based off of the needs of the program. 
So it's, so it's difficult to say, but I would say you're looking at probably a max of three to four staff being on site at most. Oh, okay. And, and the, about that many cars? About that many cars. Yeah. Okay. Quick, quick question here. Now, I've been reading for the last six or eight months in, in this knowledge about the state try, trying to bring back uh, people who have been housed out of state. Is that, that Correct. Uh, those some of the people... That, that you'd be looking yes uh, that, that's return home New Jersey program yeah. um, so it would be the return home New Jersey and Olmstead programs uh, receive uh, priority placement okay. Okay. does anyone else have any questions and is is that uh, supported by DDD you know yes it is okay. uh, yes the agency has had discussions with with uh, the director of housing for DDD along with other state officials. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. If no one else has any questions, we have uh, other witnesses that we can call. Okay. Speak okay. Well, open to the public. Will you speak a little louder? I'm sorry. Yes. Put the mic in the mic. Okay, there. <laughs> there you go. Go ahead. Okay, yes, um, I'm not sure if anyone else has any questions because we have uh, other witnesses that I'll make mm -hmm. available. Do it. Go ahead. Anybody in the public? Nope. No more okay. questions. All right. Um, I'm going to call then the engineer, Craig Sires. Okay, sir, if you raise your right hand for me, solemnly swear affirm tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. And your name for the record? Craig Stiers. Okay. We're offering Mr. Stiers as an expert witness. Um, in terms of the engineering, uh, I, it's our understanding that he has testified before the board before and other boards. Um, does the and board accept him? As, oh, oh, okay. Go ahead. Right. Does the would accept? Would the board like him to enumerate his credentials so that he yeah. can be accepted as an expert? We, we, we just go. Okay. Go ahead. Um, just to give some background as far as uh, the location, just so everybody's familiar with it, uh, the lot is located on uh, Madison Avenue off of Hall Street, which is off of Elizabeth Avenue. Um, I do have an aerial here to kind of clue you in. I don't know if you want to mark this as an exhibit. It's yeah. not up to me. Yes. I'll do it. No. <laughs> we would uh, request at this time that it be marked, uh, I don't know, R1. Okay. Thank you. Um, what you have is an aerial view of the uh, property uh, along the surrounding areas. In the center here is the property itself. Um, the uh, four-unit building is in the uh, tour towards the northeast, and then the uh, three-unit building is in towards the uh, south. 287 on the left-hand side. I'm sorry, the south is actually going this way. So it'd be 287 be south of the property. This is Hall Street, and then just below would be Elizabeth Avenue. So as you can see, there is absolutely nothing around the property other than uh, a wooded area. Um, as I said, there's two buildings on the property, uh, along with a stone parking lot. The property can contains about 25,000 square feet. Um, right now, we did note on our plan, I believe that the coverage was, um, let me just check the number here. We showed it as proposed to be 17.4, but I believe we left the stone parking lot out. So if we include the stone, it is actually 39.1%. Um, so that would be an additional variance that we would need. And the proposed after the uh, construction of the, the new building and offset of impervious coverage would put us at about 40.9%. Um, as far as the, uh, that was one of the comments in the engineer's report. Um, as far as the rest of the comments uh, in the report itself, uh, we really don't have an issue with any of them. Um, as far as, right, just check. Does that mean that you can comply with them? Yes, I'm just, just checking through them real quickly. Um, as far as the approvals are concerned, we ha already have an approval from the county. We have an approval from the Canal Commission. We also have a waiver from the Soil Erosion uh, Somerset Newton Soil Conservation District. Um, so that really addresses a couple of the comments, but everything else we can work with the, uh, the staff to make any of the necessary revisions. 
So that that's really, I mean, Just the a quick the, question. I would presume that there are also state standards uh, that you have to meet, and you will, in, in term that apply to a facility like this. Yes. All right. Is there? A I state think that was probably more pertaining to the architecture of it, but. Um, Again, you know, whatever the requirements are, yes, we will meet them. Okay. So, I mean, that, that's really that. Uh, I mean, if there's any questions as far as the engineering aspects, it was pretty Anything? straightforward. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, the next witness uh, that we have is the the planner, Claudia Vitra. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Raise your right hand for me. Solemnly swear, affirm, tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. And your name for the record? Claudia Bitran, C L A U D I A. Bitran, B I T R A N. Thanks. And we're here to offer Ms. Bitran um, as an expert. Um, planner um, we, she has testified before uh, I don't think before this board but other boards on these matters but she can give a brief um, history of her credentials if, if the board would like to establish her expertise she is licensed in New Jersey yes correct? I am licensed in the state of New you Jersey appeared yes. before boards in the past I have unless there's any objections from anybody up here will accept the credentials and you can proceed with the okay. testimony Thank you. Okay, if you could just uh, give your comments in regarding the application before the board. Okay, so the applicant is uh, looking for a use variance um, related to the construction of a new uh, building, two-story structure with two residential units. And it was mentioned before that the property already has a G1 use variance. Uh, we are here to to ask again for that variance uh, for the addition for those two additional units. So um, the property is zoned as an R R10 zone um, that allows for single family units. We are here adding two additional units to a, a property that already has uh, a total of seven units when considered the two uh, existing buildings. So we are bringing this up um, to a number uh, to, to nine units total uh, that would require us to uh, according to the municipal land use law uh, to show evidence that the benefits of the use variance would um, outweigh any detriments um, that could be evaluated <coughs> so uh, my role is mostly to walk you through the positive and negative criteria um, associated with this application with respect to positive criteria, uh, we are talking, um, as it was mentioned by Mr. Chair, that uh, we are talking about new units to accommodate for um, special needs population. Um, those are mostly uh, low and moderate income um, individuals. So we are definitely talking about affordable housing, and in that sense, um, this is an inherently beneficial use, and it meets the uh, criteria under the municipal land use law for a, uh, uh, an inherently beneficial use. Uh, I should also mention that the proposed use is also consistent with the housing element of the master plan, of the township's master plan and we have the township's fair share plan um, in terms of affordable housing. So it's my opinion that in this, I'm sorry, in this terms we are covering the positive criteria. Now in, with respect to any detriments, I don't believe there is any detriment to the public good if the variance is granted. Um, as Mr. Styers showed on the aerial photograph, uh, the property is located in a fairly secluded portion of the town, um, very isolated, and there are n no neighbors, no residential neighbors in the area. Most of the surrounding properties are uh, vacant. So um, I don't believe from the perspective of the community that there is any negative impact. And from the perspective of the township itself, um, the project doesn't hire any additional investment 
in infrastructure or utilities or anything that supports the additional units. Uh, I would just add, finally, that there is no impact in traffic, given the fact that the uh, population moving into the property would be uh, transported primarily by uh, transportation uh, options that would be provided by uh, alternatives. So there are no additional vehicles or no additional traffic on the roads. Do you have a su sufficient parking for the professionals? For the professionals? Yes, that has been discussed that um, there is how, uh, parking that accommodates staff yeah, exactly. that will be serving uh, the units and will be accommodating any type of transportation that brings and, and, and moves residents for services and activities um, throughout the, the day. Uh, we didn't mention the architecture portion of it, but I think it's important to uh, remember that the design of the building and uh, it's compliant not only in terms of the setback requirements and all of the bulk requirements of the zoning code, but it's also um, aesthetically um, very much in compliance with what um, the township has in terms of the uh, architectural vernacular. So that, I believe, adds to the evidence and the arguments that are, there are no uh, negative impacts um, to the community if the project is, if, if the variance is, is granted. I, if there is any question, I'm, I can One question address. did occur to me. Uh, is, is there any, are there any visitors for the residents? And if so, can that oh, be accommodated? Occasionally, sure. Um, you know, um, uh, it varies because in in the transitional housing you know that there is turnover there um as far as the individuals that be placed in the new project yeah there there is most likely they're they're going to have family visiting them and and that's really it, it's it's hard to say definitively who and when but um uh it would not be regular traffic based off of of my experience. In, I, in I would places. think a facility that that's this limited in terms of numbers. You're, you're, the vis there's not a set visiting hours. Correct. And the transitional sets visiting hours. And, and, and uh, um, the group homes are pretty much on their own regular schedule. Um, a lot of the individuals will, will be attending um, day program or, or, or working. Um, during the day at which time the staff will be providing transportation right. but as far as as regular visitors it it, 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 it it would be sporadic all right so in your opinion with your experience with facilities such as these and in the size of this one you have the ability to handle any excess cars or parking associated with visitors yes sir I do okay. believe that that's just uh, one question and just a clarification just to make sure uh, everybody's on the same page. The actual use, it's a, uh, a group home for developmentally disabled, uh, right? That's actually a permitted use. So they're not seeking your approval for a use variance for the new facility. What they're applying for the use variance for is the homeless shelter that was, was built. That required a, a use variance back in the day and they're technically by adding this group home to the site making the site of the homeless shelter that much smaller. So that's what triggered it. If it wasn't clear before, I, it, just to make it clear that that's what is actually proposed. So I think the, really the real critical question, I think it's already been answered, is is there any way in which the addition of this group home to that site renders the portion dedicated to the homeless shelter, is it still an operable site for that use? Is there anything that, that would negatively impact the... the the homeless shelter? No, a, a, a lot of thought had gone into to the targeting of the population for this new development um, uh, in, in raising capital. And we, we've decided that 
uh, at, you know, Alternatives as an agency sees the need <coughs> for this type of a program and also sees that um, based off of where operating funding, that it, it, it's, it's a sustainable program and a much needed one. <coughs> so that, that really was. And the site is large enough to accommodate the uses and the parking needs for the different uses on the site. Yes, we believe so. Okay. What's the length to stay? Do they stay there for years and years and years? Or? Uh, in, in a permanent housing arrangement, well, like a community residence or, 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 or a group home, it's, it's just that. It, it's up to the resident or their guardian to decide if they want to move. Um, in transitional housing, you're looking at around a six-month to a year stay. You can get extensions with that. But typically, the mission of a transitional housing program is to move them into their own permanent housing situation. And that's what the, the staff at Alternatives does to uh, yeah. uh, further uh, uh, individuals' housing needs. Good. Thank you. Does anybody else Other have any part? questions? Okay. What's next for okay. you? Okay. <laughs> we have one more um, witness. I'm not sure if the board would like to hear from him. We have the, the, um, the architect here also available. I don't think we do. I think I think the, the architecture of the of the house speaks for itself. It's in your packet. Unless you have any questions about it. I, I mean in my opinion it's a pretty attractive building. <laughs> any other that's your final witness? Yes, that's our final witness. There's nothing uh, for the architect that will open to the public. And is there anyone who would like to ask questions or make a statement concerning testimony or the application itself. Okay, we'll close. Any further board questions? <coughs> Anything you'd like to sum up with? I think the testimony speaks for itself. Thank you for the opportunity to hear us on the application. Okay. Anything from the board, including any comments or motion? Okay, I move that we approve the variance for, uh, I guess it's for, um, what's this called, ZBA 1400021, site plan and use variance at 558560 Madison Avenue in Somerset. We have a second. 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 <coughs> Mr. Betterbid. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. McCracken. Yes. Mr. Rich. Yes. Mr. Shepard. Yes. Mr. Caldwell. Yes. Chairman Thomas. Yes. Good luck with the project. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Simply much. Yoga. ZBA 14-0018. Use variance and site plan which the applicant is proposing a yoga studio, a single family dwelling at 24 Sycamore Place, Kingston. Block 502. Guys are, you guys are way ahead of schedule. I figured an hour and a half. That's pretty good. Mr. Chairman. And yes. Right. Uh, at this time, I'd like to be excused uh, for personal reasons. Okay, very good. We still have enough people. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Peter Lanford appearing on behalf of the applicant while Mr. Ardman is setting up. I will spend a moment uh, just to review where we've been uh, with respect to this application. Uh, we started this application on uh, the first meeting in January, which was January 8th. Uh, we presented testimony that at that time of the architect, uh, Mr. Wilkes, who uh, described the existing building, the renovations that were going to be proposed to the existing building, and the new single-family dwelling that was proposed to the rear of the existing building. Uh, that was all we got done on that first meeting. Uh, we then had a meeting the first uh, Thursday of February. At that time, we presented the testimony of the applicant uh, who described uh, the business both at its present location, the reasons why she sought to relocate to this site, and how the business would operate at the subject property. Uh, Mr. Ardman also testified at the previous 
uh, hearing. Uh, he presented the engineering testimony showing the proposed use. He also compared it to the uh, <coughs> permitted uses in the zone, that is the uh, single family residential zone, and uh, opined as to the differences between this use as far as open space and pervious coverage as opposed to the single family zone. Uh, at that hearing, uh, there was, there were questions or issues raised by some of the residents concerning the parking lot, uh, and since we had a little bit of time between the hearings, we got together with our professional staff and the applicant, and uh, we are going to propose this evening an amendment to the proposed site plan, which may at least address some of the concerns that were raised by uh, some of the neighbors, especially those on Laurel Avenue, and also some questions that were raised by the board members. Uh, having said that, uh, I will start this evening by recalling Mr. Ardman. Okay, I'll just remind you you're still under oath, okay? Yes, sir. Mr. Ardman, uh, just briefly uh, explain the parking configuration that was presented at the hearing last month. Certainly, and I'm referring to Exhibit A11, which is our dimension plan, SP2. So we have a sycamore at the bottom again, the driveway coming into the site. As I described, we had it to bend to the, to the left or to the west to kind of tuck the parking behind the existing residence. Uh, to screen it as much as possible. Uh, there, the driveway came in and it was uh, double loaded, so uh, an aisle with parking on either side. With that parking, uh, it, was a pro it was 20 feet, set 20 feet from the neighboring properties uh, to the west, which front on Laurel. And as I described, we were proposing a, a solid wood fence along with uh, evergreen trees, five to six foot high evergreen trees along that side. Uh, there would also be lights in the parking lot area. Okay. Um, as a result of issues or questions that were raised at the previous meeting, and also some uh, questions or, uh, that were raised with the historic commission, uh, did you come up with a reconfiguration of the parking lot? Yes. Um, so we said, all right, what can we do? Again, we felt that we had mitigated the development uh, try to do it on a lower uh, scale than a, than a full commercial scale. But what else could we do to kind of minimize the impact of the neighbors uh, to the west? So we said, well, what could we do to move the parking lot further away, uh, move the lighting further away, and potentially lower some, some impacts there? So what we, we came up with was basically a, a single loaded option for the uh, parking area that will be behind the yoga studio. As Peter's handing that out, I'll explain. Uh, yep. Yep. Mr. Bradshaw, up to A. Let's see here. Yeah, it'll be A13. So I've marked it, it's uh, labeled Alternative Parking Concept Plan, CP1, and the, the plan date is 3 4 and marked as the exhibit, as you said, A13 with today's date. Could you perhaps move the, the easel back a little bit, maybe angle it so perhaps more of the public can see it? Can all the board members see that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Plus we got this. Oh, okay. Yep. Thanks. Okay. So as described, we said, all right, what could we do to pull, pull the parking lot away from the neighbor? So instead of um, the double loaded, we basically single loaded the aisle. Off of Sycamore Place, the driveway is in the same location as it was. For some reason, this print is printed darker, but it's the same, same driveway where it was. Um, the handicapped stalls would stay in the same place, and then as you go back to the north, it would be single loaded. Uh, by doing this, instead of the 25 feet from the residents, uh, we're now 45 feet away. Uh, the one light that was going to be in that area will also be pushed away. It will be another 20 feet away from the residents. Uh, as we extended this out also, as described um, previously, we we're going to uh, stripe in a couple other spaces where we didn't have, and we had the opportunity to add two spaces. 
So now we have a total of 24 parking spaces because we know it was a question of some of the board members about the number of spaces in relationship to the mats or potential um, uh, people in the yoga studio. Mitch, how many spaces were provided prior to this? Um, the, the very original application um, 18. Yeah, had um, 18, and then we said we were going to stripe two more in there. So with that extra striping, we're basically up to 20. the 24 spaces now. Okay. Uh, we also have the opportunity, uh, we've moved the house, the dwelling as well. So again, the dwelling has been moved, uh, it's approximately, it's over 130 feet away now, uh, where it was uh, previously uh, much closer to, that, to the property line uh, for the neighbors. Um, there is also parking spaces which we've shown which would be a, along the um, a d the dwelling and as you heard Nagisa said a lot of the instructors are, are friends and have been for a long time there's really two main days where the the parking is used and you saw the chart uh, from the geese about the times that are the peak flows and so at least one of those spaces could be used additionally for an instructor uh, in basically the, the residential parking area where we have at least four spaces. So the benefits, again, were another 20 feet away from the neighbors. The same board-on-board uh, -board solid fence will be put on the west property line. We've continued to extend that solid evergreen screen all the way up the parking. Since we're further and we have some more room in there, we'll also be able to put just enough of a berm, a two- to three-foot high berm, uh, to get those plantings up just that much higher and pro provide additional screen. So we think, you know, with those basically four components, with the, with the last one being that all these cars, we faced them away from the neighbors for their headlights instead of towards the neighbors, um, we really try to think of whatever we could to lessen the impact on the adjoining properties. Um, and this change again, just slightly more pavement with this one and still well under the zone permitted. Uh, the permitted by zone is 25%, and even uh, with this change would be just about 12%. So we're less than half the permitted impervious uh, that's allowed on the lot. The stormwater management system that you had in place that you testified to and that was reviewed, uh, which is on the right side of the driveway as you're entering the site, right. would there have to be any modifications to the stormwater management system because of the additional impervious coverage? Uh, there would be a slightly, uh, there was some extra volume there, but we have room to enlarge that as needed. It would be in the same location. It would still be a bio basin. As I described, it would still have the nice plantings all on the bottom. It wouldn't just be a, a lawn basin with a concrete low flow channel. It's, it's you know, uh, uh, designed in here to in enhance the, the nature of the site. And we have to work with staff to uh, uh, do some work on that basin, and we would, uh, make sure that it met all the stormwater criteria. Okay. Now, again, just so the record is clear, where was the lighting that was proposed in the original application, and where is the lighting now? So we, we discussed that there were lights along the driveway coming in, and then there was a light that was on the, the neighbor's side that was um, approximately 20 feet away from the neighboring property. So that light for the parking area could be moved, so it would be approximately 40 feet away. So any question of spillage would be uh, lessened. It would be, sh you know, again, pointing away, facing to the east, the light. So it, all the light direction would be focused in that direction to really and make sure there's no spillage. And with the elongated parking lot, one light stanchion would be sufficient with the new proposal to handle? We could, right. With that one, we would look at the lighting and, and work with your staff to see if a second one was needed. There was discussion with the board the last time that there's only a, a few nights of, you know, lighter time uh, or later time uh, in the summer hours, virtually, you know, no time where the lights would need to be on. So it would be a couple of nights um, in the winter hours. So we could minimize that lighting and, and, again, had agreed to shut it off when everybody's out of the building. But it potentially might need a second light uh, along that um, elongated area, but, again, facing away from the neighbors. Okay, uh, one other modification that was also uh, discussed at the previous hearing, there was in the original plan a sign. It was a, a small monument sign at the entrance to the property. Uh, 
there was a question to, again to try to remove the commercial aspects of this uh, did you discuss that with the applicant yes discuss that with the applicant and they're in agreement to uh, take that sign off the, the project plan so that will no longer be there uh, that was also one of the questions raised by uh, in the historic review if that was appropriate so agreed to take that okay. off the plan and just one other thing back on the lights that was one of the uh, components actually when historic did review it that they were okay with for just for so the board was aware of that okay and are there any other changes on that plan from the plan that was reviewed by the board last month uh, that's basically it all the landscaping that we showed up front will remain the landscaping to the neighbor to the east will remain and will be extended as we previously agreed for their backyard and again the that uh, the dwelling as we showed which was uh, just over 42 feet away from uh, the property to the east is now approximately 130 feet away so we've moved it uh, as much as possible. And again, this full field area here, which is over two acres, which will remain basically undeveloped. Thank you, Mr. Hardman. Any board questions? The last meetings, one of the landowner neighbors mentioned something about uh, uh, fence around the stormwater basin. Is that still there? Yeah, that's fine. Yes, we would agree to that. Uh, where did you say the light was? The original light was on basically this half of the parking, and it would have been about, about 20 feet from the property line, so it'll be 40 feet now, and with a potential second one back to the north. Okay, so there's nothing along the driveway. Yeah, sorry. Yes, there, there have always been. Those didn't change. I was just okay. talking about the ones that changed. Okay. Right. What type of fence was discussed around the basin? I don't think we got into detail. What we usually do in these is a uh, split rail fence with uh, a mesh on them. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, just so I'm sure I'm clear and to uh, reinforce it, it, the elongated driveway features the three foot berm <coughs> with the plantings and it's all extended basically to the rear of the property. That's correct. All right. If there are no, you have anything for him then? I have nothing. I'm sorry, I have nothing further for this witness. All right, we, hmm? we will then open to the public for a limited for the, for the discussion water -based. concerning, not discussion, but questions based on this testimony that was just presented. <coughs> Uh, maybe please make sure you get close to the mic. Is it a question? Right. I don't think it's on. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. One more time. Meredith Rogers, 17 Laurel Avenue, Kingston. Two questions. Um, the first is you talked about parking and people pulling in so their headlights weren't going towards the neighbors? Correct. Can you guarantee that? I mean, how would you enforce that? Because I know a lot of people do like to back in, especially in a parking lot like that. It's, it's my experience that the vast majority pull, pull head in. So is there an enforcement? No. But I would say, you know, <clears throat> my experience on 90 percent plus the people pull head in. And the second question is those, um, I'm going to just that are already there? That's correct, and they'll remain. Okay. We, so we've designed around them so they could stay. Okay, because I was wondering if maybe you could put this um, runoff basin in that part of the property instead. If I'm sorry, I did, can, can you talk? I didn't hear what she said. Yeah. She Remove the um, retention pond or whatever it's called <coughs> to right. that part of the property as opposed to right in the front? Why did she? Um, well, we would. We'd want to remain those trees, so that's why we didn't place it there. From a drainage standpoint, this really picks up the, the most of the water the way we're, we're piping it. And I don't, again, it's not going to look like a hole in the ground basin. It's going to look like a natural landscape feature there. <coughs> With a fence and all that. Um, what about in the back of the parking lot? You couldn't put it back there? We did not get good drainage results back there when we did testing back there. So okay. that's why it's not back there. Thank you. Yes. Any other people? 
Hi, my name is Elizabeth Romano. I have a contract to buy the property next door to the proposed yoga studio. Yes, that property. How many gallons of water does it? Twenty? Is it twenty-four cars now? Right. How many gallons of water does that throw off in, let's say, a hurricane or other major storm? So, uh, yeah, I don't. I can check a gallon. And we we uh, design it for you know cubic feet is how we do. So, okay, uh, feet. and I, if you give me a minute, I'll, I can pull out my notes okay. and take a look at that. But the, our design is based on township and as well as there's a lot of review agencies. The DNR Canal has a review, and they have a pretty stringent review so that we have to collect the water for the 210 in a 100-year storm, mm -hmm. and then we have to pipe it. So not only what runs off, because obviously water runs off the property now, we have to pipe not only what runs off now, we have to reduce it. So we have to have a reduction in what's allowed to go off the property <coughs> now. Um, that water right now, is, as a sheet flows off, basically goes westerly. So it, it does not impact your property. The way it goes now, and as I'm sure a lot of the neighbors, there's a lot of water that lays in front now and, and then comes across to the west. We're going to be picking that up, piping it down system, Sycamore to the municipal system. So there, whatever drainage issues are up front now of, of standing water, which would really be along the front of your house, are going to be taken care of by our drainage system that we're putting in. So you're saying that all the runoff does not go into the retention basin. It actually gets piped out? It goes to the basin first, mm -hmm. then, then it gets piped out. Okay, so it would not be affecting you know, underground water movement that way? No. To the north? To the, nor to the, the east, I'll say, to your potential right. property. Right, it will not. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, next. I'm Liz Chase. I spoke before. To Make sure you meeting. get close to the mic, please. Can I have your address, you please? Me? Also? Liz. I'm sorry? Your Liz address. Chase address Liz. at 49 Laurel Avenue. 49. And my property. Okay. So I don't see how this has improved anything, this plan. You're supposed to be asking speak? questions now. Okay. Um, I want to know what the benefit is for the extension. Ask a question. Yeah. The extension of the parking lot um, so that it now uh, follows the, the line of our property all the way from the start to the finish, where before it only obscured part of our property. So we, we weighed the benefits before for all the neighbors to the west and that we felt from, from what we heard from the neighbors that pushing it uh, to the east would, would be a benefit, again, by be able, being able to put a, a berm in there to raise the planting up, being able to get the lights further away, no headlights pointing in that direction, and everything further away. So, again, it's, it's an option that we thought was worth looking at. You know, it's the board's discretion if they agree with you that the first one is better, but we felt that this addressed comments that we heard. Well, being the neighbor to the west that has the longest joint property line with 24 Sycamore and having the parking lot extended further, I would like to know what benefit we would have from this. It does not seem to benefit the neighbors to the west. And I don't think you really addressed the answer to that, how it would benefit us. I think all, the, all those issues of movement and screening are how we feel it will benefit you. I realize it is closer to your single property now, but uh, there's three other properties here that we're clearly further away from and, and screening better. We're going to continue the screen and the berm up along the full length to your property as well. I, I think the, the, the answer to the question, and it will be up to the board whether they're satisfied, mm -hmm. but to summarize your, the answer to your question, They've moved the parking further away. They've added a double staggered row of trees where there was one. Is that correct? <coughs> They've added a three-foot high berm upon which the, the trees will be planted. And I believe at the last meeting you agreed to extend the board-on-board -board fence up to the, the full length of all of the, the neighboring properties. That's correct. So that's the answer to your question. They, they have made some measures. Again, whether the board is satisfied, you know, it will be up to the board, okay. but they, they, have a, they have addressed some issues. Uh, just one clarification. Under the new proposal, can you compute approximately how far the edge of the parking, the corner of the back edge of the parking lot is from this lady's house? It's 
Just give me one minute. I guess my question would be. Or to her property to the. Yeah. Oh. Well, to the property line would be would be 45 feet. The same offset is to all the neighbors. So to the property line, it's 45 feet. And then the house is, I'm not sure which is. Yeah, which is your house exactly? One one structure fits yeah, back. Okay. And, and for the sure. other people, it was 20 feet before, right? That's correct. Okay, no. I don't mean to yep. interrupt your questioning. You know, it was 20 feet from ours before, also part of our property. Our property is the long longest right. property along there, mm -hmm. so some of it is 40. All of it is 40 feet now, and some of it was 20 feet <coughs> before. So that's. And, and, the, and the single family residence, which was 42 feet, is now about 130 feet away. With the parking lot in between, however. That's correct. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask again how high this berm was going to be that you're showing a planting. Three feet. Three feet. Of a three foot berm. Yes. And a 12-foot fence? No. Or was it a 6-foot fence? 6-foot fence. And somebody mentioned that it would be a split rail fence? That no, the, the fence along the property line would be a solid wood fence. The split rail fence would just be for protection around the stormwater basin. So a split rail fence doesn't usually screen out the sound of cars starting up every single day till 9 o'clock right night. that's why that's not what's on the property line what's on the property mm -hmm. line is a solid fence so well that's what I mean a solid, solid fence down. doesn't screen out the sound of cars starting up there's nothing that's going to screen that out that I know of yeah so any other questions my question was did you really believe that that would screen out the sound of the cars in that parking lot it, it's a, uh, a more of a visual barrier uh, than a, it's not a noise wall. Thank you very much. Next. <coughs> Hi, Jim Dye of Forley, 32 Sycamore. Question on the uh, lighting of the driveway. Yes. That hasn't changed? Correct, that has not changed. Uh, as you come in this front entrance drive, Mm -hmm. Those two are, as we showed at, at the discussion with the board last time, if the board has recommendations on how to alter that, you know, we're willing to hear whatever their thoughts are as well. Can you explain a little bit more detail what that lighting will look like? Sure. It's running the whole length of the driveway on both sides? No, it, it's just on one side of this entrance driveway. There's on the left side, on the on west the side? On the left side. Uh, there is a, a pole on each side. It's just 12 foot high and one enclosed <laughs> head. So there is a... a um, a, a shoebox for better word head so that the l lamp itself would be tucked up so it's not like a PSENG uh, street light where you can see the bulb itself from a distance it'll be the light itself will be up in the housing with the reflection of a light just down on the ground so that helps with any back spillage of light to the neighbors as focusing it down as well as not being able to see the light source and I'm sorry how many of those uh, we have two on the driveway and then there would be two uh, along the parking area is what we're looking at. And will they be on continuous 24 hours? No, definitely not. We, we agreed that at the close of, of business each day they will be shut down. And so they'll really only need to be on the couple of nights um, that they're open later and again just certain times of the year. This time of year they'll be on. In the summer where they close down at uh, most nights by 7 o'clock they won't even need to be on that. Okay. Thank you. Next. My name is Barry Pavlak. I live at 35 Laurel Avenue. And it's the house on the corner of Sycamore and Laurel. Um, when you discuss the drainage down toward Laurel coming off the property. Right. Are you aware of the kind of curbing that exists on that section of Sycamore Place? Well, right along a, a stretch here, there's really, we have a second plan, uh, but a big stretch, there's just edge of pavement right when you get to the right. intersection. There's, there are no gutters or curbs. Right. There's none. 
do you expect an additional amount of drainage water to be coming off of this property because of the parking lot? No, we're going to have less water, actually, okay. because it won't be just flowing across the property <clears throat> and into the street and down that gutter. It'll be in the pipes. And then as we pipe it down, uh, we have to get to the inlet at the corner, yep. and the town engineer will probably have us put a couple of extra inlets in along the way. Now, you're saying pipe it down Sycamore. What, what do you mean by pipe it down Sycamore? So it'll be underground. You're going to actually put a sewer yes. line right. into Sycamore. That's correct. Okay. Well, that answers my question. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And just for the board's knowledge, actually a benefit for the street is that based on piping it down there and, and your engineer wanted us to uh, probably add some inlets along the way can help pick up drainage along Sycamore in that gutter uh, that lays there in certain uh, locations. Any, anyone else? <coughs> All right, and for this part of the meeting, we'll close to the public and move to the next witness. Mr. Poliniak. Okay, sir, if you raise your right hand, you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Spell your last name for me. P O L Y N I A K. Thanks. Mr. Poliniak. By whom are you employed? Uh, I'm employed at uh, Dolan and Dean Consulting Engineers in Martinsville, New Jersey. Okay, and can you give the board the benefit of your educational and professional background? Sure. Uh, I graduated from Lehigh University in uh, 1998 with a Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering. Since that time, I've been working as a traffic engineering consultant um, for the last approximately 11 years. I've been a licensed engineer in the state of New Jersey. Um, working as a traffic engineer, a traffic expert, and I've uh, testified before approximately 70 or 80 planning and zoning boards uh, within the state of New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Poliniak, your firm was rep uh, retained to do a traffic analysis with respect to the proposed project. Is that correct? That's correct. And can you indicate uh, what you did in conjunction with that analysis? Sure. Uh, what we did is uh, perform an analysis to determine the traffic impact of the proposed yoga studio uh, on the adjacent intersection of Laurel, um, Sycamore, and Church Street. We went and we studied what would be the confluence of the busiest traffic of the roadways <coughs> along with uh, the busier times of the um, yoga studio. We went out and did traffic counts at that intersection um, back in September. Uh, specifically, uh, Thursday, September 4th, we counted from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. to get the uh, evening rush hour on the roadways as well as the evening yoga classes. Okay. Uh, did you perform any morning counts? Uh, we did not perform a morning count. No, we did not. And why didn't you perform any morning counts? Uh, the reason for that is that the typical schedule for uh, the facility, uh, they would not begin class until uh, 9.30. Typically what we find as far as our traffic studies go, the morning rush hour peak falls between 7 and 9 a.m. And therefore the first classes fall outside of that peak. So the evening would be the more um, uh, critical hour to, to look at. Okay. Okay. And when you did your analysis of the traffic volumes, uh, what did you find during those that evening peak hour? Uh, well, we went out and counted and we found that our, our analysis period was going to be from 6.30 to 7.30 because that's the time, the hour that includes the um, exchange or turnover from the, uh, the, 5, uh, the 5 p.m. class and the, and the 7.30 class. So we looked at that to make sure that we got an ingress and egress uh, associated with the, with the studio. We, um, we found that the volumes along Laurel Avenue were somewhere in the magnitude of uh, 700 two-way vehicles at that time. Uh, Sycamore is, uh, as you know, a, a pretty light, lightly traveled roadway, and we found a, a substantial amount of left turns from Church Street onto Laurel, uh, coming from 27. We then projected a future condition. Um, we, we provided a growth rate onto those volumes of 1% for two years, which I find to be conservative because we compared our traffic counts to some counts that DOT had in the area and from uh, 2013, and they kind of aligned. They didn't show much growth from uh, 2013 to, to last year when we did our counts. But we still applied a 1% growth rate for two years. And then we projected some traffic 
associated with the studio. And we, and we projected a pretty conservative tra traffic uh, volumes for the studio. Um, we're assuming 20 in and 20 out in that hour. Um, based on are, the are you using the word conservative to mean that you're undercounting or overcounting? Uh, with respect to the peak hour of operations, we're, we're, we're probably underestimating, or I'm sorry, we're probably overestimating what would ha currently happen at the studio if we were there today. Okay, so what that means is when you say conservative. Conservative means we're, we're creating a more constrained analysis to make sure that we've uh, overestimated the traffic from the site and also created a future no build condition with that growth that that adds more traffic to the intersection that I feel won't necessarily be there uh, two years from now which was our study year I, okay. I think in I think in traffic engineer speak conservative <laughs> means that they're assuming a kind of a worser case correct, scenario correct, correct. We, we, higher number scenario we build in a little factor worse, of safety not worse. <laughs> that's what I thought worse. it meant but I wanted to make <laughs> sure everybody out there got that thank you um, <clears throat> We study the peak. We, we study the peak hour, uh, and we estimated approximately 20 inbound vehicles and 20 outbound vehicles during that hour. We then performed our level of service analysis for that intersection and found that movements. Which intersection? Uh, Laurel, Sycamore, and Church. The adjacent intersection directly to the west, and uh, we calculated levels of service A, B, and C for the critical movements that were analyzed. The left turns off of Laurel operated at level of service A. Okay. Just quickly run through this ABC stuff so that people sure. are right. thinking. Because you realize there's a lot of people here who are very interested in what you're saying, and you have to say it in a way that they can understand, or we'll be here all night with you answering questions. No problem. Levels of service are a way to gauge delay associated with a turning movement or a through movement that is stop controlled. So A, obviously similar to a report card, being the best, F being the most constrained. Uh, it's, it's based on delay per vehicle. Uh, like I said, the Laurel Street left turns operate at level service A, meaning that someone can make a left turn from southbound Laurel onto Sycamore uh, within zero to 10 seconds of delay. That's how long it would take to, to wait. The, the Church Street approach uh, was the highest traveled. That was the level service C. And the Sycamore westbound approach was calculated to be a level service B. So from these findings, I was able to determine that, determine that there's uh, sufficient capacity out there, meaning there's sufficient ability for the road to handle more vehicles without causing a substantial delay or impacting the levels of service in a negative manner. Uh, the, the site with generating approximately 20 vehicles in and out is a very low generator. I mean, that's, that's one vehicle entering the site every three minutes or one vehicle exiting the site every three minutes. So. Uh, it's not right, a very but the problem is is that I think you're looking at the wrong thing when you're looking at the traffic did were you out there to do these counts I personally did not do the traffic counts. okay well I can tell you that between 530 maybe five o'clock and seven o'clock there is a line of traffic that runs from the intersection of Laurel Avenue uh, from from where it meets Route 27 all the way back to um, probably where uh, where the dip in the road is there's a dip in the road and it takes um, it takes from to get from there to Route 27 takes approximately six light changes now if it takes you six light changes to go from that distance what level of service is that to that, isn't it? Uh, yes, if you were okay. trying to reach right. the signal. Yep, and Laurel Avenue isn't far from the signal, so making a, if your intention is to make a left-hand turn off of Laurel onto Sycamore, that the, at that, and you start from the point where you run into the traffic, the, that left-hand turn takes a lot more than 50 seconds. It takes, takes 15 minutes, which again, probably seems to me like a, an F. And that's what the real problem is here. It's not so much how much traffic is on, is on Sycamore, it's how much traffic is on Laurel, and what we're doing is we're adding to the traffic on Laurel. Amen. Amen. Superstar. And, and, you're, and, you're, 
you're likely correct. I mean, you're speaking more towards a five to, to seven period. We were looking at the 6.30 to 7.30, which is later in that, um, later in that series. Uh, we quantified the hourly traffic volumes uh, on Royal in our report. Uh, and like you said, it's busy from five to six. There were 786 two-way vehicles. But as you get from seven to eight, that almost cuts in half. It's about 433 two-way vehicles. So when the yoga studio is experiencing its peaks at that 6.30, 7, that, that overturning of their, their peak periods, the rural traffic is substantial. Is that 7.23? That's what you wrote down here from 6 to 7. Royal Avenue has 723. You're right when you say from 7 to 8 it's reduced. It's down to 433. But that's still a significant number of cars. And that's a problem. Well, our study area, our study period was from 6.30 to 7.30. So there was even a reduction from that 7.23. We didn't look at 6 to 7, because uh, I believe the one class was not yet, is not yet going to be starting. Mr. Polignac, based on you had an opportunity to review the chart that was put into evidence with the average class sizes over the last two years uh, at the present location. Is that correct? Yes. And the classes run at 5.30 in the evening. And during the week, there are historically the number of students was between 8 and 12 that attended a class during that 5.30 session. That's correct. With 8 to 12 students going to the subject property, what impact would that have on the traffic volumes and the levels of service that are out there at the present time? Yeah, essentially none. I mean, you're, you're talking about minimal traffic volumes, 1% um, of the volume uh, on the roadways, um, and that's assuming all of them are making a, a left turn coming from the same direction. You're going to have some kind of split uh, north and south on, on Laurel. You're essentially, with eight vehicles accessing Sycamore, it would be negligible. It would almost be imperceptible. Now, if the project were to be developed with six single-family residential dwellings, uh, I assume that those six single-family residential dwellings would also generate traffic. Correct. Okay. Uh, and I would assume if there's single-family dwellings, the people work and probably would be going or coming home from work at that time. That's right. Uh, okay. And what is normally the peak or the average trip generation of a single family residential dwelling? Or if you want to multiply it out for a six unit project, what is the trip generation for six single family homes? The, the evening entering volume would be somewhere along the lines of about four or five vehicles for the six houses, which is you know, only a shade under the eight to 11 anticipated for the yoga facility. And I think it's also important to note that over the course of the day, uh, the RSIS states that a, a single-family home can generate 10.1 uh, trips per day. RSIS? Yes, the Residential Site Improvement Standards. Uh, they have some trip rates for single-family <coughs> homes. And they, they consider that a home can do about 10 trips over the course of a full day, which is not materially different than what the yoga studio plans on doing in a day as well. So <clears throat> over the course of a full day, six, this, the permissible six, <coughs> six single-family homes would generate almost almost identical traffic to the okay, studio. We're, if we're using the conservative numbers, I, I'd like to take this example in the other direction because there's a lot of disagreement about whether there can be six houses on that. In fact, uh, it probably appears that maybe four is more likely. So how do your projections look with if we reduce them by one third in terms of single family <laughs> houses, it's not a it's not a lock that you can get six houses out down there. M Mr. Thomas, uh, I, I don't mean to disagree with you, but I think the testimony of Mr. Ardman at the last meeting was it would either be five or six, and, and he was clear that it would be five. That he had no time mentioned that there would be four. If you want to recall him, we can recall. No, him. I, I don't want to recall him, but I know that. It's not been engineered, and it hasn't taken into some of the other taken into consideration some other issues. However, we, you know, I'll take that your word for that part of it. Have you also you heard 
Mr. Shepard's example and his comments about the traffic on Laurel Avenue, has your report taken into consideration the residual effect that that might have on the traffic coming out of this facility? For instance, when I know I'm having a little trouble making the left on Laurel Avenue, and I know that I have to sit to get through the stoplight, I will very quickly explore going out of your driveway to the left, go down the street about 15 seconds and make a right turn that goes directly out onto 27, where I can make another right turn and go through the Laurel Avenue Route 27 stoplight without virtually anywhere near the same kind of weight. And actually, that can work the other way if there are yoga practitioners coming on 27 from the north going south, they can also make the right-hand turn into that street and come around to this facility and escape that intersect. That intersection is problematic. Has, has any of your studies taken that possibility into consideration and what effect it has on this entire neighborhood? Um, it's not going to have a, a, a impact with respect to like levels of service and delay. It, it's not a substantial number of vehicles to go through there to get to the um, Shaw 27 intersection where someone's going to have a longer commute or a longer no, trip to pick up their kids. It's not going to affect the delay at the intersections, but it's going, it's going to make a difference in the amount of traffic that goes through that neighborhood that isn't going there now. Yeah, they're going to go. That's exactly the point. They're going to fly through the neighborhood without any delays. Well, I mean, number one, I, I would hope they would do the speed limit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Okay. I, I have, a, uh, se I second. Need to have <laughs> some real, a real feeling of comfort about the traffic. Because I, 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 this is a, I think we've this heard. This is a very distinct residential. <laughs> Section. I, I think we've heard that concern, and I don't think the applicant would be opposed to restricting the left turn movement out of their driveway to prevent people from heading into the neighborhood and make sure that they head to the Laurel Avenue intersection. I've heard we've made that suggestion a number of times in different places, and the first thing that everybody says that, that is against that suggestion is who, who's going to enforce it, and how are you going to enforce it, and do you really think in this intersection, in this neighborhood, if I want to make a left turn coming out of that driveway, do you think that sign's going to stop me? I mean, me, per me, idea, me personally, yes. That idea is fine on paper, well, but in reality, I don't know. If it Mr. Thomas, you can give the municipality Title 39 powers to issue summonses. Uh, I know you and I have gone through this. I understand that, but who's going to stand down there in that intersection and give summons? If the police are patrolling that, they're not every single day at every single moment, but if there are violations, and, and you're familiar with a site not too on Cedar Grove Lane where a similar restriction was imposed, and I'm by glad you brought it up. I <laughs> and summarily, <laughs> routinely, ignored <laughs> daily. Wait, wait a minute. If, so, what I and you and I have had that discussion at, at various board meetings when, when this issue has come up. There are certain people that will ignore it. The majority of the people adhere to it. And, and therefore, it does have an effect. Are you going to stop everybody from making a left turn? No. But you will at least control the traffic. And to some extent, we can control, as was done in that other situation, through uh, constant monitoring with the, and this was a case of a school, the parents, uh, to try to get them to comply with the requirements and there are times that the police have gone out there and enforced title 39 violations at I, that site i understand and you're right there's been a lot of working together in the situation that you're talking about and i think having first-hand experience living there my positions become if those people are stupid enough to do that and they get in an accident they deserve what they get there there there's a situation of putting themselves in, in danger. Coming out of this intersection is not likely putting themselves in danger, but what it does do, it, it is a, it, unless I'm hearing differently, which I haven't given them a chance to speak yet, 
this ha this potentially has a a negative effect on a very residential area. It's it's not that someone's life is in danger. It's not that it takes 20 seconds to make the turn or three seconds to make the turn. It is a distinct change in what's there. From from if I may ask Mr. Poliniak. Uh, just to, to try to clarify, you indicated that, that generally based on RSIS, a single family residential dwelling generates approximately 10 trips per day. Correct. Is that correct? That's people that live there going in and out, uh, mail coming to the house, deliveries, things of that nature. Right. And again, if being very conservative, and I'll take Mr. Thomas's position that there are only four houses, that would mean that there would be 40 trips generated per day out of that development, conservatively speaking. That is correct. Okay, and if there were 40 trips generated for single family houses, when they exit that site at a control, at, a, at an intersection that I guess would have a stop sign, uh, those residences can either go left or right out of the site. That is correct. Okay. Now, the trip generations over the course of a day from this yoga facility based on the numbers and the attendance at the classes is approximately what? Uh, weekday uh, is ranging anywhere from about 35 total trips to uh, just under maybe 60, 60 total trips. That's during the course of an entire day. That's the day. Okay. And during the evening peak hour, uh, with the class starting at 5.30, 5.30 if I put my glasses on, uh, the average attendance over the last couple of years uh, has been basically 10 students at that 5.30 class. Yeah, maximum of 12. Right, and they all come into the site. Correct. Okay. By the time they leave, based on the testimony that the classes last about an hour and a half at 7 p.m., and they're leaving the site, what kind of traffic would they, uh, or what kind of impact would they have on traffic on Laurel Avenue or Sycamore at 7 p.m.? Well, there's substantially less traffic on Laurel, so much of the left turn concern would be reduced. However, I think what we're, it's also important to note that not everyone is traveling south from the site. So if you had 12 vehicles leaving the site, you could have a 50-50 split on Laurel north-south, then you're down to six vehicles. So you had six vehicles traveling south, trying to make the left turn south on Laurel. And if the queuing were so bad that no one could go, you would have six additional vehicles traveling through the neighborhood, which is one every 10 minutes, which I understand to the neighbors is more than, than what's there now. But when you consider that they could be residential homes, it dilutes it a little more. And if you put a left turn restriction, out of six vehicles, you would hope all six would not make the left turn. If you're convinced someone may make the left, it could be one vehicle. But I, I, think, I think there's very little impact to the neighborhood based on the quantity of traffic anticipated by this facility, based upon the experience of the operator and the number of students that they currently see uh, today. That's an, that's an excellent presentation. Um, the the my 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 difficulty with it and with what you've said also, Mr. Lamfret, is that the facility that they're in now is down in the Kingston Shopping Center, and they're next to a um, a, a, a rent, United Rental Center that is very noisy. I would expect that if they're at this new facility and they have 20 spaces available, they're going to fill them up. There's going to be there's going to be a full class every day every night for every class and that is what I think we have to think about that in my opinion is what is conservative thinking I think if you're going to look at at this thing and say well we're only getting 11 people now uh, I think that that's a foolish thing to do because I think that that we are building something for 20 people and if we build it they will come well it, Mr. Shepard if you heard the applicant rec recall the applicant's testimony at the last hearing. Uh, we are building it basically because there are on weekends we get as many as 20 students. Okay, uh, the empirical numbers for the last 
two years and even before that she testified haven't really changed. The fact that the location changes doesn't necessarily mean you are going to get more students. The numbers that she's had, she's had, and I can again recall her to just to verify that, but the numbers in all the years that she's owned the facility haven't changed from those uh, 8 to 10 during the five o'clock hour, uh, the six or seven people that come in the evenings, those numbers don't change. Uh, and you're making an assumption because we move point A to point B that the numbers are going to change. Uh, it's not, the intent is not to attract more students, the intent is to conduct what we're doing at a better location for the services that we are providing. Mr. Chairman, if I, yeah. um, a number of questions on, on, on how the traffic analysis is conducted. Um, you had made a statement before about that, uh, well, you, you assume 20 cars, right, in the peak hour for the facility? Entering in? and exiting, yes. Okay, so 20, and, and that's within an hour? Within one hour. Okay. That would be the in and out. Uh, within when, you, when you apply that to the existing capacity of the, of the roadways and the intersections, do you assume, do you spread that out over the hour? So do you assume that basically, you made the statement that there's one car every three minutes. So do you assume there's one car, three minutes later, another car, three minutes later, another a car? Actually, no. And that's it. This is a, this might get technical, but the- Well, it's actually extremely important. And, and the reason is, because the actual operation of the facility is you're going to have 20 people coming in Correct. pretty much all at once and 20 people leaving all at once. So your analysis needs to, uh, I'm hoping your answer is that your analysis takes that into consideration, didn't spread it out over, no. the, over the hour. You're 100% you're correct, and we did account for that. Uh, the, the analysis um, includes something called a peak hour factor, and generally, like an office building or, or something like this where there's a class scheduled, you need to take into account that rush, that, that, that immediate rush of everyone coming out. So what you do is you, you lower this peak hour factor, and it applies a factor to the, because we study an hour, it, 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 if you had a peak hour factor of one, that would be consistent flow. Mm -hmm. So we reduced the peak hour factor to 0.5 uh, for those movements to account for the fact that, um, to account to the fact that everyone's going to be leaving at once. Does that mean, well, okay, 0.5, and I don't know how these things work, but that seems like that's half. So does that mean it's not half? <laughs> assuming, no, but does that mean that you you consolidated within a half hour? Uh, everybody coming and going within a half hour for this for the. For the approaches to the intersection, yeah, yes. So it's. I mean, based <laughs> on your understanding of the operation, I mean, I would think if somebody's coming for a 715 class, it, there's going to be a very concentrated period of 10 minutes, I would think, before. And actually, consistent with the testimony that was provided at the last hearing, it was. Oh no! The over you know when we have these classes back to back, there's not going to be a parking problem because the second this class ends, everybody takes off, and then the parking lot's going to be empty for the next class that comes. So you know the testimony by by the applicant was everybody takes off all 20 cars within five ten minutes. So do, does your analysis take that five ten minute rush, 20 people coming, and particularly if it's a back to back, you're going to have 20 people coming, you know going 20 people coming within a five to ten minute period. It does. It, 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 it consolidates those trips. Uh, I, I can't say whether it consolidates it to five or ten minutes. The program deals in 15 minute increments. So by applying... How, how many minute? 15 minute in increments. 15? Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's a factor that's applied um, to increase the volume over well, the course of the hour. I, 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 I think, I, hour, yeah, I, I think it, this is a really important point because you're saying it's putting it into some point whether it's 10, 15 minutes, I think the board and the public's going to want to know what that factor brings it down to. You, you plug it into the, the computer, but this board and everyone's going to want to know. I mean, we all know, we're assuming that within that 5, 10, 15 minute period, everyone's going to come and go. You're saying it makes it shorter from 50 minutes, but you're not sure what that is. I think... You need, if you don't know that, you need to come back and tell this board what that number is, because that's, that's a real important point. Well, there's two functions of that. It doesn't really push it down into a certain time frame of five or ten minutes. What it does is it increases the approach so that the analysis is more constrained by increasing the volume for that movement. Um, and the second... Well, let me just, let me, just so I can, and it's very technical um, stuff here that... 
it's going over my head, and I'm sure it's going over others. It, the analysis, I think I heard you say that the analysis that you did, the 20 in, 20 out, is assuming that all those movements are happening within a half hour. Is that, is that correct? No, no, it's not within a half hour. That, that 0.5 doesn't equate to a half hour. It's, we analyze the peak hour for accounts, but what we really do is analyze the highest 15 minutes. Highest 15, okay. That's what, that's what the program does. Okay. So if you had a one peak hour factor, 1.0 peak hour factor, it assumes that every 15 minutes is the same. Okay. So we applied a 0.5 peak hour factor, but you have to understand that there's ambient traffic involved in that too, that's already occurring. So it's not just that, it's the site traffic that that's being applied to, it's also the background traffic that it's being applied well, to. Well, that, that the point you said, four equal 15 minute periods. So when you do the 0.5, what does that break it into? That two, two, uh, what does that mean? Um, Remember, some of us that have done this a long time and understand it, most of the people haven't, so I'm not yeah, to be fair to them, they need to understand that. It, it increases the traffic in that 15 minutes by 50%, if that makes sense. So, but you're saying it's still, it, it's, it's still breaking it into four 15-minute periods, but it's Double. instead of going, you know, at 10, it's 20. Instead of 2.5 vehicles per 15 minutes, it'll increase it by 50%, so it'll be 3.25 oh, vehicles. Okay, so, so it increases the 50. So if you had spread it out over the 15 minutes, so that's, that would be five cars. If, if, if it was over the hour, it would be five I, I cars. I think before we, we get into the minutia of the well, analysis. Now, this isn't, I mean, let's, let's be fair, everyone. This is, this, honestly, this isn't the minutia. This is really, this is no, I understand. Really the most important part of this whole conversation is that what? you need to be studying, and from what I'm hearing is if you break it into 415, you're not really studying, you're not putting all the cars into that 10 or 15 minute period. You're studying, you know, 25, 30 percent of that, and that, I, that, that's what I'm hearing. And if we're wrong, you need to explain it, because if we have been doing this for 25 years, are hearing it that way, the people from the public surely are hearing it that way. I don't want to get hung up on the mathematics and the equations included within within the the program. What's important to note is that we took 20 vehicles for the facility, and we are anticipating 12. So we've already increased the site by by more than 50%, the site traffic. Well, no, well, yeah, that's, that's not right. the no, point. No, no, that's, that's no it is the point, because we're getting a level of service B for... Well, first of all, no, wait, wait, wait. First of all, you, you, the number's all over the place, because you're, you're saying you're a conservative by going 20, because, right. because they expect 12. But the parking lot has 22, right. and the facility has a space for 33 mats. So you're telling us, well, we expect 12, but you were accommodating 33, we have space for 22, and 20 is, is more than more than conservative. Mr. Healy, again, I think now you're mixing up the numbers, because... Those are the numbers. I, no, no, the, wait, no, wait, wait. On the plans. Wait, wait a minute, Mr. Healy. Uh, uh, if you looked at the, the class size, the only time we hit 20 in a class size is on a Saturday or a Sunday. Why are you proposing a, a facility with 33 mats and a parking lot for 22? Well, first of all, we showed a facility that had the capability of having 33 mats because that's the way Mr. Will, that's the size of the building and that's what it would house. If the board felt that there was a restriction on the number, you know, a restriction on the number of attendees is appropriate, we can discuss that. But when we're talking about weekday peak hour traffic, which is what we're talking about now, the numbers that we have provided to you never showed a weekday in the last two years where there were more than 12 people, not cars, 12 people who attended the facility. Let me finish. On a weekend, we've had 21 people who have attended the facility on weekends. And therefore, since there is no parking in Sycamore, we had to provide the parking for the 21 people that would come on a weekend. So you can't say that... I think you're, 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 you're making it, a, a, it very confusing, I believe, in that you're proposing a facility with th 33 mats, parking for 22, but then re repeatedly saying in terms of impact, yeah, but it's really only going to be 12. <laughs> So, you know, and no. I think Mr. Shepard's comment that basically saying, I think we have to assume, based on the actual proposal, the worst case scenario based on what you're accommodating for. Now, the testimony we're providing tonight is that the peak hour traffic based on empirical evidence has been 12 attendees. 
not 21. Okay, well. And, and the testimony has been, and the, I don't remember what the exhibit number was, that on weekends, on Saturdays and Sundays, we've had as many as 21 attendees. So you can't apply the 21 number to the weekday peak hour traffic, because that doesn't well, happen. Yeah, yeah, but you, you, you absolutely can, because you have, you, you have to, because you have 20 parking spaces and space for 34, so if you're being conservative, which you said you're doing, you can't use the 12 number, you got to use the highest that you can possibly fit. And I think that's what we're trying to understand. Well, I mean, there, if, if the board is concerned over and I can, I can call my client back to talk about why the numbers have not changed and why they probably won't change in the future. But, it, you know, it may be that if the board is concerned about the weekday peak hour traffic, uh, those class sizes can be restricted. And, and quite frankly, we don't envision those numbers changing based on evidence. Well, that, and that, that's, that gets more reasonable to what we're talking about because if we don't, if it's not restricted, then you have to do the traffic based on it having the most you can have. If it's being restricted and you can't go over that, then your argument in how this is being done has some validity. Right. But but again, we're looking at, you know, again, it's, it's not a constant, Mr. Dominic. We don't have, you know, eight people uh, every day or 20 people every day, but we do have evidence to show us when we have our 20 people and we have our eight and, people. And the board, I think everyone understands that, but there's an, this is, you're asking for a use variance and when you're doing that, the board has to consider the worst thing that can happen. And if there's no limit, we understand what you're saying, but that doesn't mean that t tomorrow it can't be sold. And if there's no restriction, that there'll be a big marketing campaign or something else like that. Because it, it, it goes with the property, uh, not, not with the owner. So you saying that you could put a restriction on the class sizes brings more validity to what we've heard so and, far and, from the testimony. And, and we haven't gotten there yet, but we can have that discussion. And, and I think to some degree that makes sense. And, and based on the testimony of the applicant, we're not looking to increase our right. class sizes. Uh, so we can talk about restrictions. I, I don't think, in a, and again, if you look at the situation we have here, it may be that there's a restriction uh, of a maximum class number during the week and a different class number on a weekend. But, I, but I, if you're... If you're even remotely considering agreeing to restrictions, I'd almost right. rather deal with that now because that could affect that. If, for instance, if if her most of her classes are no more than twelve people, I'd say restrict them to fifteen, cut the parking lot in half. Then then you eliminate with that you eliminate a lot of the traffic. You eliminate the at least half the objections to the parking lot. Now, I'm just, you know, I'll put that under the category of brainstorming, but, you know, I, I, when do you discuss this? Rest restrictions make a big difference on what he's talking about. I, I, I think we can discuss the restriction. I don't know if we can restrict it at least. I, and I think it, there should be a different number based on attendance for weekdays and weekends. And, and, and therefore, the, again, we don't want to put a situation where we have a parking lot or that is insufficient to deal with the attendees because that creates parking problems in the neighborhood and you don't want that either. I think if we're going to design a parking lot and design a project, it should be able to all be handled on site. But if you want me to take a few minutes now to start discussing this with my client, I would be happy to do that. Or if you want to continue and then we can uh, take a little recess later, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, what what uh, input am I getting from the board on that? Well, let's take a break and then uh, we'll get to it. I, I don't know if that's restriction. workable. 15, I don't know, she was talking about she doesn't pay herself now. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, I mean, from a, it's a business. and uh, Again, Mr. McCracken, I, I, I think some of the comments that were raised by Mr. Dominic and Mr. Haley and Mr. Thomas are, are, are legitimate. As you know, this board, when there are use variances, has imposed conditions on operations, and you have the right to do that. Whether the applicant can agree to those conditions is another story. Uh, but there's no, you know, we might as well have that discussion and see if we, if there is some common ground that can be reached. And if there is, fine. If there isn't, then maybe we're back to single-family houses. But well, that's hey, Pete. I think there's th there are two issues: is how many parking spaces you need at the peak 
which is going to be sometime on a weekend, mm -hmm. and what restrictions you may agree to to have both on a weekday and a weekend. So there's really like three things, because you may need most of that parking or all that parking for the weekends. That's correct. I, I, I'm just going by the numbers that we're talking about. But if you restrict it, because the biggest traffic issue is during the week, is, as several of the board members pointed out during the week, that helps alleviate some of that issue. Okay. I mean, if you want, I could take a few minutes now or, Chairman, or take I, a 10-minute uh, recess. Can I, Chairman, can I just yes. ask one follow-up just to maybe put this the traffic Again, and this, this question is geared at trying to understand if your traffic analysis evaluated right. the in and out within that, let's say, 15 mi minutes. Sure. You know. So you had said that you basically chop up the hour into 15-minute increments. And if you apply the rush hour or whatever peak hour of factor of one, I'm right. assuming that that means there's going to be a total in each, not for your analysis, but generally there would be right. 10, 10, 10, and 10 in and out. Yes. Okay. But then you said you applied this other factor of 0.5 that increased it 50 percent. So does that mean that the number of that, that peak was fifth became 15? Correct. In that 15 minute yes. period. Yes, it would take that 10 and it would increase it by 50 percent. So you're okay. And does that have it for just one 15 minute period or the 15 minutes throughout that whole? The period? program, although we look at the hour, it, it literally gives you the result for that 15 minutes where you apply all those factors. Okay. So you basically in your analysis. The worst case scenario, 15, does 15 we, minute was a total of 15 in and out. Yeah, we would. So that'd be about 7.5, well, seven, seven or eight in and out, in and out within that peak. Yes, but you're, we're talking about trips going to the intersection at the driveway. Yes, but at the intersection, you have lefts and rights, so it's it's split up. Right. Okay. But coming out of the driveway would be 20, seven or eight cars within that 15 minute. Seven eight, yes, seven five eight. with an additional okay. handful to account for the PKR factor, correct. Okay. Okay. All right, thanks. All right, then we'll take 10 minutes. That means class is